All right, I want to greet those that are watching us online. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in today. Not all our seats are full, but I know there are people that are watching uh, from the comfort of their lounge in their pajamas, maybe. But you're welcome to be uh, looking in on our service today. I, uh, I looked this morning as we were coming to church, I'd heard the forecast said rain. Oh, there it is. I, you know, there was some anticipation uh, when I opened the curtains this morning that the rain would have already been here. And I went, not yet. We got down here, got the door open, then it arrived. It's a bit like that sometimes with God. Before the reality of what He's doing catches up with us, we know in the heart of our heart that He's moving. We know already that there's a forecast for His goodness to be poured out upon us. And we just got to keep our eyes up. We, we just got to keep expecting. We just gotta, sometimes we need to be still. And know that His promises are yea and amen. Sometimes there's a delay. It's not a denial. Amen. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. If God's promised something to you and there's a delay, it's not a denial. Mm -hmm. Just keep believing, keep looking up, keep waiting for what He wants to do. Amen. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. I want to say thank you to you as a congregation for sending Jenny and I uh, off to the retreat with the other senior pastors. Uh, it sounds all very romantic. Yes, it was. But in addition, it was so refreshing. It was so cool to sit with other pastors and, and see their scars and cry on each other's shoulders. And it, it was, this week's been Mental Awareness Week, Mental Health Awareness Week. And uh, boy, did we need that. I see some of you know that. Because it's really important to you and to me and to us that we're looking out for ourselves and that we're looking out for each other and that we understand the plan of God is that from time to time we just need to stand in the rain and let Him wash over us. So I'm saying thank you to you because you're the ones that sent us. I know the trustees approved it on your behalf, but I'm, I'm sincere when I say thank you for allowing us to take a few days away to uh, get stirred up. To get stirred up. I was thinking, have we got uh, our logo? Can you put up? Uh, can you go to slide two or three? Go down one, please. I was just thinking about uh, who we are and what God's doing in our midst. Uh, we've got a couple more certificates to give out for our footprint course, but recipients aren't here today, so I'll pause that. But I was just thinking about, you know, this whole uh, heart that we have to empower people to reveal God just inside our four walls. Come on, somebody correct me. You're allowed to call out him. And all of life, if we only do it inside our four walls, we need to turn the cameras off now. Turn the cameras off. No, no, we're, we're getting passionate about Jesus because we want to transform communities. And, and again, I just went back to the core question of why. You know that three-year-old question? You know that question that drives mum nuts? Why? Why? Well, the why of our mission is that we want to reveal God outside our four walls in all of life. We want passionate followers of Jesus who are contagious. You use that word very carefully these days, I know. We want to be spreading the goodness of God wherever we go, leaving behind a residue of His love and His peace. That's the purpose for which we get together. So we get stirred up a little bit. Come on, get stirred up a little bit. Because He wants us to do something outside the four walls. I've got a few minutes to share with you a couple of things that God put on my heart during the week that really extend where we were a couple of weeks ago. You can keep watching that. Can you go down to the next slide? Just so everyone keeps looking at something. A couple of weeks ago, we, following Father's Day, we were putting, pressing in a little bit more to this whole idea of the Father heart of God and uh, how He's a good, good Father 
And uh, two weeks ago, I spoke about the orphan spirit. Do you recall? Uh, I said some things about the demise or the condition of the orphan spirit and how it robs us of certain things that God wants us to have. Uh, it, it impacts our identity. It messes with who we believe we really are. It cuts us off at the knees in terms of our self-worth. Yeah. In fact, if you remember, I referred to the orphan spirit as the black hole of our soul. Let me say that again. It's the black hole of our soul. And I explained that the black hole out in space was that place where everything just got sucked in and nothing ever went out. And the orphan spirit does that to our soul. Life just becomes internal and there's no expression outwards. I talked about some of the symptoms of the orphan spirit. I talked about the fact that it creates insecurity and jealousy. You don't want this list again, but I'm giving it to you anyway. It drives us uh, to search for love. It creates competitiveness in us. Now, those of you who were second born, there's another reason for being competitive. Just justifying that one. But uh, the orphan spirit makes us always competing and pushing others away. It stirs anger and fits of rage. The orphan spirit gives us a poor evaluation of who we really are. That's what I want to call my message today. Who am I? Who am I? Do we have a song? Do we have a song coming in? <laughs> Who am I? Have we ever sat ourselves down, me, myself, and I, and said to ourselves, Who am I? I want to talk about that, probably just for a few minutes this morning. But I want to, I want to sow a few seeds in your heart that I hope will go away in this week. Uh, given enough rain will germinate and grow. Who am I? Before I move here, just to remind you concerning the orphan spirit, I've got a note here I haven't uh, been watching. Uh, the same father of lies. Get that? The father of lies. That's what Jesus called him. Uh, the Bible says in John chapter 8 and verse 44 that the one that fell that brought the orphan spirit into being was the father of lies. In other words, he begot those lies. And when those lies take root in our life, then um, we lose the ability to see who we really are. So I'm going to push back some lies today. I'm against some lies. The other day I said I was after the orphan spirit. This morning I'm just going to push away some lies because as long as those lies are living in our life, we can't see who we really are. You want to see who you really are? We, we've got to push away the father of lies and ask our heavenly father to show us who we are. Who am I? You know, we often get our reference of who we think we are from the world around us. The big people in our world. Who are the big people in our world? The people that have got authority. You know, our mom or our dad or our teacher or somebody that we look up to, the big people in our world often tell us who we are. And in some cases, that will be okay. That's an external measurement of who I am. But in some cases, that's not been very reliable. In some cases, that's not been in agreement with who God says I am. So if I go searching for the answer, who am I, and I just ask the big people in my life, I may or I may not come up with the right answer. Who am I? If I ask you, if you asked each other, if you ask somebody around you, who am I? They're going to give you an opinion of who you are, right? Some of us keep asking Facebook. We think Facebook knows who we are. We put things up because we want them to like us. Sometimes we try to get our identity through a world around us. Sometimes our search for who we are causes us to ask social media or some other platform or some other place. 
who does God say I am? Have you ever been uh, to uh, a house of mirrors? Let me talk about that for a minute. A house of mirrors. You go to a house of mirrors, it's a fun place. Uh, you walk in there and there's mirrors set up in all places and angles. And as you walk in, you find four of you standing in the room. That's entertaining. And then as you move a little bit, you come across a mirror that gives you a new image. And the short person becomes much taller. And I can't do this well, but, you know, the fat person becomes really skinny. Maybe I did do it right. And, you know, as you stand in front of the mirror, you get to see yourself. Who am I? I'm this very tall dude now. Or I'm this very skinny. You know, we've got a, a new image of who we are based on, and we call it a faulty mirror. It's not really reflecting who I am. I notice on our media, that uh, social media, that you can do similar things. My grandkids are classic at this. You start a conversation with them and suddenly their faces are all distorted. <laughs> and things are popping off their nose or their eyes have gone, you know, what, you know, this distort, distort. I know that's still them behind the image. But they're projecting a whole different image right now. Who are they? In fact, I'm going to tell you something. As long as you don't report it back to my grandchildren, they won't watch this, I'm, I'm good. It frustrates me. <laughs> because I really know who they are, but they're showing me some other weird creature. You with me? Yeah. I, I, I want to just go and, and shut down the pretend face. Uh, get rid of the moustache, because they're not old enough yet. Or whatever it is. And, and see the real them. Because I know they're there. I can hear their voice. They're cackling away and asking questions. I know it's them. But when I look at the image, it's like, no, that's not them. Who am I? And who am I going to ask? I'm sure. Faulty mirrors. The Bible says uh, in several places that we are the reflection of the image of God. In 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, if you have a look there, it talks about us seeing ourselves as unveiled, fa seeing our unveiled faces and being transformed into His image. Ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I want to suggest to you that the Word of God is an accurate mirror. It says a bit about mirrors. James, in the book of James, uh, chapter 1, verse 23 to 25, it says that we need to hear the Word of God and look into it like it's a mirror. I'm paraphrasing this. Please look it up. And it says it's not wise for us to look into the Word of God and see our reflection and then forget who we are, or forget what we saw. So when we look into the Word of God, it will show us without distortion, I believe, what God wants us to see. Who am I? I need to look into the mirror of His Word. Many of us go to the mirror every morning, right? Hands up if you visit the mirror every morning. Help somebody beside you, they're having a problem this morning is daylight saving issue. Why? Well, but why? why? Why do we, why do these people around us all visit the mirror every morning? Why? Because it's important to us to know that we are okay. And okay might mean brush the hair or the teeth or shave the beard or, or, or whisker or whatever it is. We, we, need, we look into the mirror because it's important to us to know that there's not something on our face that we don't want somebody at 4 o'clock in the afternoon to tap us on the shoulder and say, oh, by the way, <laughs> we look into the mirror to make sure that we are dressed properly, right? Have, have you ever had the experience where halfway through the day you discover that your shirt was on inside out? <laughs> Have I got that as a personal experience that no one else has copied? 
that makes me unique. You should try it tomorrow. Put your shirt on out, uh, inside out and see how long you can go before somebody taps you on the shoulder and goes, by the way, I know because the tags are on the outside now, right? It's really confusing. We look into the mirror because we want to make sure that the thing that we are reflecting is right in our heart. We look into God's word because it's important to us to for us to discover what it is God wants us to know about him and about us. Because the Bible says that there's a match in the image. There's a his image should be seen and found in us. Isn't this an amazing thought? When you look into the mirror, you should be seeing something of God's pleasure. Some of us are wanting a mirror right now. Huh? When we look into God's Word, we need to understand He's speaking to us about what He sees in our lives and what He sees of us. And if they don't line up, it's time for us to do a little bit of fix. That's why we look in the mirror, isn't it? To make sure we can fix whatever needs to be fixed. I want to share a personal moment that took place in the last few days as I pondered this question. I want to talk to you about what I saw when I asked God, who am I? Before I go there, I'm just getting things in order here. I just want to reference Colossians 3, 9 and 10. It says there, uh, in the verses before, a critical, it says, take off the old man. Take off the old image. Take off what used to be, what used to be seen, who you used to be. Take all those things off. And goes on and says, don't lie to each other anymore. Take off the old self, its practices, and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. One of the reasons for looking into God's word is that we can see who we were made to be. Is that we can see how he sees us and his purposes. So I sat alone with God for a few minutes in the last week when I asked him this question. And I want you to do this, not right now because it, it won't work that you do it while you're hearing me, but I want you to do this when you go home today or sometime when you can get along with God this week. I want you to ask God this big question, who am I? Look in his word if you need to. But remember the word already is in you if you've been in his word. I never opened my Bible for this conversation. I just said, God, who am I? This is what I heard God say by the Spirit. You belong to me. I paid a price for you. This is, this is how my conversation with God started over. Who am I? I heard him say, you belong to me. I paid a price for you. I knew that there was a verse like that. 1 Corinthians 6 20 talks about you are not your own, but I have purchased you. I've bought you. I've paid a price. You belong to me. However, when God said this, my heart sunk a little because I thought to myself, does that make me a chattel? Does that make me a possession? I don't know if you've ever been involved with weddings where there's a bride price to be paid. Jenny and I performed a couple of weddings uh, overseas and other nations and places. And I remember going to the bride price ceremony and we went there with this, this uh, truckload of stuff. Uh, we brought it, it took several of us just to take all the goodies and place them at the feet of the bride's parents. Including the crate with a big pig in it. And as the proceedings went on, something inside of me went, I don't know if I really like this. I'm not familiar with bride price ceremonies. And it looked terribly to me like we were buying the bride. We were paying a price so she could become his. I saw the opposite happen at the wedding ceremony where all her possessions and everything she ever owned was put into um, boxes and brought and put at the feet of the groom. And when the Lord said to me, you belong to me, I paid a price for you, I went, oh. Am 
by your channel. And then I had to be silent long enough for him to explain what he had just said. You see, I totally believe we need to belong. In fact, we say it often, people need to belong before they believe. Belonging isn't, but it, it doesn't mean you're a chattel. Belonging means that you have a place. You belong here. You have a place here. And as the Lord started to speak to my heart, I realized I don't belong as in was purchased. I belong as in I have right to be here. I belong. He, he was saying, you belong to me. I paid a price. When I thought again about paying a price, I moved away from what I just explained, the bride price thing, and I went, oh, you saw value in me. You valued me. You valued me enough to pay a price. And my heart started to open up. Who am I? God's saying to me, you belong to me. I paid a price. I value you. I stayed with the Lord a bit longer and I listened hard. I said, Lord, can you say that again? Really, really open my heart to understand what you're saying. And as I just sat with him saying, who am I? Who am I? <coughs> I heard him say, you became of me. You became of me. Uh, this might go right over your head. This might not touch you, but boy, this touched me. When I recognize that he's not just saying I'm a channel, but he said, I, you became, it's like I begot you. And I thought of great verses like, he formed me in my mother's womb. Before a single day was lived, he knew me. You became of me, God said to my heart. A priceless value I place on you. Wow. If this is a true mirror, if this is not a distortion, I just had a fresh glimpse of who I am. God's heart, God's thoughts, you became of me a priceless value I placed on you. Who am I? I want you to ask yourself that. God's not going to answer you with the words I've just shared. But God's got an answer that will really touch your heart. Because I believe that God wants us to understand our identity in Him. This is how our conversation ended. And this is about all I have to share this morning. So I'm going to invite the worship team back. God said this, this is the last thing I heard him say before I had to move back to another session that we were doing. I begot you, and that's why I never forgot you. I heard my father say, I begot you, and that's why I never forgot you. A scripture came to mind, Isaiah 49 and verse 15. It says, Can a mother forget a baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she has born? What would the answer to that question be, people? Never. Never, 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 never. And even if it could be, God says, though she forgot, I will never forget you. I don't know what you think about yourself today. I don't know whether you've asked the mirrors of the world to tell you who you are. I don't know if you've looked for affirmation or clarification somewhere else. But I'm going to say to you this morning, there's only one person who can really identify who I am. I value your thoughts. But at the end of the day, what you think of me isn't necessarily going to impact my life like knowing what he thinks yeah. because I begot you I never forgot you I'm believing I'll probably go to the grave with that thought stuck in my heart because when God said that to me and I said who am I and he said 
I never forgot you because I begot you. I realize this. It doesn't matter what happens in my life, in my world, in my circumstances, in my budget, in my plans. Somebody saw me with so much heart and value that he declared over my life. You're mine. I paid a price for you. I begot you. Don't worry, I'm not going to forget you. That means whatever I'm going through, wherever I am, whatever's happening to me today, I have an assurance in my inner world that my Father has the greatest love for you and me. I push away every lie. The enemy says you're no good. The enemy says you're probably not going to make it. The enemy says it's not going to work out. I push away all those lies and I come back to this truth. He begot me. He formed me. He created me for His pleasure. And out of that knowing in my heart, though I walk through water or fire, I understand. He's there for me. Somebody needs to hear this this morning, the same word I just got. He's never going to forget you. He's never, never, never going to forget you. We went to the table of remembrance this morning <clears throat> because he said, I love you that much. Greater love has no man than this that he lay down his life did. Thanks for leaving us this morning, man. And he did. Because he was trying to declare into the mirror of your life, look, I love you this much. I love you this much. I forgot you. There is no way I will forgot you. This morning I want to ask you, invite you, take another look at who you are. Not look at your circumstances. Not look at the events of your life. Just look at who you are. Because if we are grounded, if we are anchored, if we are strong about who we are, everything else in life is going to flow out of that. Out of the confidence of knowing that we're not a mistake going somewhere to happen. Because that's the lie the enemy has sown in some of our hearts. We struggle to, to do certain things because we don't want to fail, because we've got to please somebody, we've got to please God, we've got to please God. No, you don't. You already please God. God said, I love you because you're mine. And I paid a price. Amen. Let me finish with this. Who are you? I just told you who I am. Who, who are you? Who are you? Would you take that question and sit with God this week and ask Him to reveal His heart?